work for a company called Couchbase, which is a NoSQL database vendor, and has nothing to do with my talk, so this is pretty much the last time I'm gonna mention Couchbase in the talk, uh, except to say this. How many people actually have heard about Couchbase? There's like a lot. Let's try something else. How many people have heard about MongoDB? See, this annoys me so much. But all right, you be quiet. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah, so my point was, uh, all the people who said they don't know about Couchbase, uh, my good friend Laurent has a talk about NoSQL in a couple of hours. You should definitely go and listen to that one as well. All right, so about, enough about that. We're, we're here to talk about databases, uh, specifically graph databases. Uh, what are for, how are you gonna use them, how many of them there are. How many people have actually, actually know about graph databases and know at least one? It's like three, four, seven people. Uh, okay, that's, that's good. It means you're in the right place. So those seven people can go, everyone else stay. Um, all right, just have a little history. How, uh, how long ago have NoSQL databases appeared, more or less? Who can tell me? I'm seriously asking, it's not a trick question. Five years, 10 years, who thinks it's 10 years? It's about 10 years. All right, so NoSQL databases in general, the modern type obviously, because all the databases before SQL were technically NoSQL, uh, but I'm talking about NoSQL databases like Couchbase and Mongo and all those, they have a history of about 10 years or so. Uh, how about relational databases? Who knows when the first relational database came out? It was around 73, 72, 73? So let's say 40 years ago-ish, right? Now, how long ago have graphs been invented? That was about 400 years ago. So graphs are actually a much more robust and mature technology than any of the databases technologies we have today. And uh, graph theory as a subject of mathematics has been around since the, uh, around uh, 17, I think 36, uh, when uh, Euler had com came up with the first graph theory proof. Uh, which was to the seven bridges of Konigsberg. How, is anyone here a math student or studied math at all and remembers the seven bridges of Konigsberg problem? Not a single person admits, oh, one guy, well done, sir. All right, so the seven bridges of Konigsberg was actually uh, just a uh, theoretical question of how can you uh, visit all the bridges in Konigsberg, which, by the way, does anyone know what city this is today? Konigsberg? You guys in Europe, who knows what Kongsburg is? It's Kaliningrad. Well, that's the first time someone actually answers this. I've done this talk a few times. It's actually a city in Russia now. Um, so anyway, the problem was, how can you cross uh, all seven bridges only once and visit all the parts of Kongsburg? And uh, this is a specific problem, but Euler presented a general proof that it's not actually possible to do that. Uh, and I won't go into the proof, but this is considered the birth of graphs as a mathematical subject. Uh, and, from, and this brings us to uh, a lot of history since then, and now we have a lot of uh, work and a lot of uh, theory that exists about graphs. And when we have graphs, we do have data that is related and connected to each other, and we want to run graph algorithms on and treat data as a graph. So when you have data sets with a lot of interconnected relations between the graphs, and you want to uh, ask questions beyond just uh, SQL stuff, like select star from database, you want to find all the connected nodes, or you want to run some kind of graph algorithm with less computations, you can't usually do that on a regular relational database uh, beyond some very simple cases which I'll talk about. And for this, we need a specific purpose-built graph database, which is, uh, it has two important properties. First of all, it stores all the data in a format which is convenient for graphs, which means it stores relations between data items. And second, it has native processing capability, which means it can do graph traversals, it can run and calculate relations between nodes without using indexes. Because if you have to go and for every adjacency between two nodes graph, consult an index, that becomes very expensive computationally and becomes unwieldy, so there's no way to actually process graphs uh, unless you purposely b engineer your database to facilitate traversals without indexes, right? Which means you have to hold your data in memory, have to hold your data in memory 
in a way that's uh, built specifically to facilitate traversals between nodes through edges. So let's talk about where that's actually useful. Uh, and before we get into specific use cases, I'll tell you a little story. Um, in my job, I go to a lot of companies and do a lot of consulting. And uh, usually in order to sell them Couchbase, because that's what I do. I go and help build systems with Couchbase. I just broke my promise of not mentioning it. Anyway, uh, I was at a large uh, advertising company about a year ago, and they were considering moving to a NoSQL database from MySQL. They had an existing system which used MySQL, and it was overloaded, and they couldn't keep scaling anymore because uh, they were getting a lot of traffic, a lot of data uh, queries, and they were considering some kind of scalable and distributed database, and they settled on Couchbase because it's very fast. And uh, we started the process and started you know, uh, architecting the new system. And over time, I discovered that the main reason that their MySQL database is so overloaded is just one tiny piece of their uh, actual system, which is the security system. They had a very complicated permissions mechanism. Uh, it's an advertising company, so they have a lot of objects, you know, ads, uh, users, uh, groups, uh, brands, a, a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, basically, for every user that wants to show an ad or for every ad that wants to change, it needs to go and calculate who has permissions to do that. And in order to do that, they were running queries with 10 or 11 joins to go and calculate who can actually see this data item. And that thing was uh, basically slowing the database to a crawl and the rest of the system, which was like 95% of the rest of the system, was perfectly fine to run MySQL. Um, so at this point, uh, the obvious question was, why would you even consider moving to Couchbase? Just solve your little problem and keep using MySQL. But of course, I didn't say that because I like my job, uh, but that was the obvious question to ask. Um, so we kept working and you know, we built the whole system on Couchbase and it actually worked because you know, it's a very fast database and it, they just solved the problem brute force, right? So they had a bunch of queries, they were running something like at peak, so close to a million queries per minute, which is a lot, just to calculate permissions on the object they want to display. Um, and when we're starting this test this thing in production and discovered that it still isn't scalable enough and we ca had to cap keep adding nodes to support their permission system, I finally broke down and asked them, why, why didn't you guys look into Neo4j or some kind of graph database to just take the permission system, cut it out, put it in a system which is purposely designed to calculate relations on the graph and just stay with MySQL. By that point, obviously, they were invested and already bought Couchbase, so you know, I could ask the question without being fired. Um, but the point remains the same, right? This was a very good use case for taking just the one part of your system that doesn't work uh, in your database, put it in a different database, and keep everything else where it belongs, which is a normal My uh, MySQL database. By the way, how many people are here are actually developers and use databases, as opposed to not? How about the rest? What, what do the rest of you do? <laughs> um, how many people are database uh, administrators or DevOps people, something like that? Nobody. How many of you are students and are here because you have to? <laughs> this one, one guy said yes, by the way. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. Um, Okay, so managers maybe, architects? That, that would be me, like trying to avoid writing code as much as possible, okay. Um, all right, so fair enough. Um, so let's talk about use cases for graph databases. And there are quite a few, but usually it all comes down to the fact that you have a lot of data which, is, which has a lot of connections between them, uh, which isn't in, in itself a problem, but the problem comes when you have to query this data in a way that is inherently um, complicated. So for example, that permission system, and, and I'll actually show part of this system in a bit uh, as a live demo, um, had just a lot of moving parts. If it was something simple, for example, if we just had users and ads, right? You could do it with a single join query and that works. But then you have groups. So now you have two joins. Users, you join to groups, you join to ads, you join to permissions. Then you add roles, right? Roles, users can have roles, groups can have roles, can have This microphone thing is really not working for me. 
Uh, all right, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. going. If it sounds really weird, you guys tell me, right? So is the more you complicate this, and again, the system, it's, it's very easy to model, right? You just add more tables. But to query this, it becomes very computationally expensive. Now, there are a lot of systems like this. For obviously, the most trivial example of a graph system or something that works well with a graph database, who can, uh, trivial example, anyone can imagine something? What will be the perfect use case for a graph database? Social networks, thank you very much. That's obviously the first thing anyone thinks about. Uh, you'll be surprised most big social networks don't actually use a graph database to store their social graphs. Uh, because we'll talk about this, so graph databases don't actually scale very well beyond a certain size. But yeah, obviously if you have a social relations and you want to find the friend of a friend of a friend, graph database seems like the right thing. Yeah. Not, not keeping it close to my mind. All right. So I like to move my hands around when I talk, and this is making it difficult. I keep having to fight the urge to, my, to wave my hands around. So anyway, social network is a good example, uh, and uh, sadly, most big social networks don't actually use graph databases, but it's a good example. What, what about actually, uh, actual examples uh, for, um, in real systems? There are several companies I know of that I visit which use graph databases for fraud detection. Because a lot of fraud, for example, bank fraud, involves uh, finding correlations between different groups of uh, people and different items. So for example, you have people, credit cards, cars, and bank accounts. And a, and a single person can uh, open 20 bank accounts under se several names. And uh, for each one, he'll register a different address. But if you want to find all the people who have multiple bank accounts with a, with a single connecting address, that's something that's very hard to model, in, for example, in a relational database. It's a very heavy query, and if you have to run this in real time every, oh, for every transaction, it's just unwieldy and impossible to do. In a graph database, it's very easy to find all the people who have one common node in a graph. Uh, other use cases, uh, a lot of game companies uh, use graph databases. Uh, for example, the, to model the game economy. There is a... Um, there's a mobile game called Monster Island, and what they use Neo4j, which is a graph database we'll talk about in a bit, to actually model the entire game economy. Whenever they want to build out, uh, bring out a new version, they have a graph database with all the items and quests, quests and rewards and uh, all the ways that money can flow in and out, monsters and what loot they drop. And uh, I'm assuming everyone knows what loot and dropping means, right? Because we live in the 21st century. Um, and every time they want to introduce, for example, a new quest or a new monster, they add it to the graph and then try to rebalance it to make sure it doesn't affect all other different parts of the game because now, for example, uh, some loot becomes too common or some quests become uh, not worth doing. And they do that every time. It's not a real-time database. They use the graph database as an analytical database. Uh, but it's a very good way to model a very complex interconnected system. And there are a lot of examples like that. So uh, and a few examples uh, in, in real time, actually, uh, just so you can get a feel of how it works. So let's talk a little bit about what actual software there is to do graphs. This is a screenshot from uh, DB Rankings, uh, dbengines.com. How many people have actually heard of this website? Besides uh, the one person from Couchbase who also religiously checks it every day um, to see if we moved up or down. All right, so this is the site which aggregates a lot of data from uh, Stackflow and Google Trends and all that, and it actually ranks databases by popularity. And you need to take it with a grain of salt, but overall it gives a very good indication of what databases people actually use and what uh, databases are uh, either new or not as popular. And as you can see, Neo4j, which is a uh, Java-based uh, graph database, leads the field by far. It's the most popular uh, graph database followed by Titan, Orient, DB, and ArangoDB. Uh, now, Titan might cease to exist very soon as a thing, because the startup that was maintaining it got bought out by uh, Datastax. Uh, but Orient, DB is a new and very interesting database. Uh, it's not as popular yet, because it's pretty new. And ArangoDB is also a new database. It's not actually a pure graph database. It's what's called a multimodal database. So you can use it as a document database, uh, or it ha you can run SQL queries on it. And you can also have graph semantics in the database. And I'll show you some, uh, some small examples from OrientDB as well in a bit. And beyond that, we have a bunch of frameworks which no one has ever heard of. 
except for uber geeks and people with very special needs. And I don't mean special needs, I mean people um, Okay, so in this talk, and I don't have a lot of time to go into a whole bunch of graph stuff, we're actually going to separate graph databases from graph frameworks. And what makes uh, the main difference between databases and frameworks is databases are geared towards what's called OLTP queries, online transaction processing queries, where you want to run a query and you want to get the result in real time right away, as opposed to graph processing frameworks, which usually operate on a lot more data and usually run analytical queries on it, which take a while to process. So for example, when Facebook wants to go and process the entire social network graph, which has more than a billion vertices and more than a trillion edges, uh, they can't use a graph database. There is no database in existence that can hold a trillion uh, vertices. So, uh, sorry, tr trillion edges. So what they do is they use Hadoop and a uh, graph processing framework called Giraffe to run this computation on something like a thousand machines overnight. Now this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about specific graph databases which usually have smaller data sets but can actually run real-time queries and give you results right away. So that brings us to actual how would you query a graph, right? So when you're doing math and you're talking about graph theory, it's pretty clear you write an algorithm, you do the math, and you, you don't actually have to run this on any real data because you, know, you don't need to do anything real when you're doing math, right? Because physics is actually applied math and computer science is also applied math. So computer science has to do stuff, math doesn't. Um, so when you actually have data and you want to query it, how do you express your query in a way that will run on the graph. Now, how many people here know SQL? SQL, I would expect everyone to say yes. How many, I won't ask how many people don't because that would be embarrassing. But yeah, pretty much most people here know SQL. So, and if you want to query a relational database, it's very straightforward, right? You say what you want to find, you define conditions, and the query runs, scans the indexes, and does all that stuff. Now, if you want to do the same thing on a graph, how would you express, in what language would you express wanting to find all the people whose friend up to a fifth degree uh, likes cars and, ha and knows some of the people you also know. Expressing that is a query which has conditions in it and has to go and traverse an unknown number of steps in between. That's actually very hard in a language syntax, right? So there are quite a few graph syntaxes which have been invented over time. I'll show you a few of those. Uh, and I'll talk about what works better for each uh, use case. So the first syntax we're going to be talking about is a language called Gremlin. And this is a generic language, not specific to any database. Uh, it's an uh, open source framework for querying graph data. And uh, Gremlin itself is based on um, Groovy, which is a, a fun language. And essentially what you do is you define the conditions for the graph traversal. You say where you want to start, which node or group of nodes on the graph you want to start, and then you define all the steps outwards. And the algorithm steps you define then go and execute on the database engine, whichever engine it runs on, and it will find all the nodes which actually end up matching the conditions you defined in the query. So for example, a very simple query would be, we take a graph, which is G in this case, we take the first vertice, right, which is just the, the item with vertice with ID of one, the first node, and then we'll go and find an outgoing edge, out E, which has the label friend, right, which is the connection, and we'll find any incoming vertice, so any vertice this connects to, and then we we'll take its name, right? So this, will, what will this find? It's a very simple graph query, right? What's it gonna find? Seriously asking, don't be, don't be embarrassed. Friends of, uh, of one, that's, again, not a trick, trick question. I don't have trick questions, it was a very straightforward question. Exactly, so it will find all, all the names of the friends of whoever V1 is, right? So now you can go and complicate this quite a bit. For example, I can add another similar step, right? Out edge friend in V name, and it will find me all the names of friends of friends. And then what if I want to eliminate loops, right? I want only the names of friends of friends, but not if it goes back to me, right? Then I can add conditions. For example, all the out edges which aren't pointing to me, and so on. And there's a very complicated syntax, which I'll show you a bit of in uh, real time. But this is, uh, again, this is a generic language, and it supports a bunch of different database backends. So for example, I'll show you how you can run this query on Neo4j, and you can run the same query on OrianDB, and, uh, 
Obviously, it will run differently on each database, but in terms of expression, I only need to run the query once. And if it decides to switch to yet a third database which also supports it, I can do that. Obviously, the performance is going to be different, right? Because each database will execute the query differently and depends on the driver. But the fact that it's a high level language is very helpful when designing and building it. I don't even have to run this on the graph database. There is, in fact, a plugin for Gremlin, which one of the guys from Couchbase wrote, which runs on Couchbase. It runs terribly, obviously, because it's not a data graph database, but it does run. Now, the next language we have is uh, the one used by OrientDB, which I mentioned earlier. It's um, a very interesting multimodal database that's pretty new, uh, and it's gaining traction now in uh, a lot of niche use cases like this. Um, and they ha actually have a SQL derivative, which both gives you SQL syntax, because it's a, uh, they can also treat their uh, database as a uh, uh, document database and a list of relations. But then they have expansions to the SQL uh, syntax, which allow traversals. So for example, if we look at the example from before, we have s something very similar. We'll select all the input uh, edges which, followed, which are all followed by out edge called written by from our graph database, from V, from our table, uh, where the name of the singer is Garcia. Now this query comes directly from the sample database that comes from DB, and it lists all the concerts and songs of a band called The Grateful Dead, which no one has ever heard of be, uh, below the age of 40. I, I swear I had to go and uh, look, up, look up on Wikipedia. So whoever in OrientDB is in charge of this, you guys need to find a new example data set. Um, but anyway, turns out there is a band called The Grateful Dead, and they went on tours quite a bit, and they have a lot of songs. Uh, so we'll uh, run some queries and see that. And finally, and after this, I swear I'll go and actually show you some real code, and we'll do some real stuff so you can feel like you've learned something and not just looked at slides. Finally, there's a language called Cypher, which uh, is the native language of a database called Neo4j. And Cypher is a very cool language in that it's, um, it's based on uh, drawings. So when you want to uh, go and express a query on a graph, and you go to a whiteboard, and you write the query on a whiteboard, how would you do it? Something like this, right? I want to find all the items A, which are connected to some kind of B with an arrow called friend. How, would you, how do you turn this into a graph query in Neo4j? You just turn it into ASCII art. And that's a valid query that runs and compiles and returns results. That, that was my uh, good point. I should have turned that off. But anyway, uh, so the language itself is built essentially uh, with queries that define a pattern that you're looking on the graph. You'll notice, that unlike before, like Gremlin, we don't define, for example, a single node and then generate the steps of the traversal. We actually define the pattern we want to look for in the entire database, and then we'll get all the results which match it, right? So if there is an edge, in edge, we give it the name A, which is connected to, sorry, a vertex, which is connected by an edge called friend to another vertex, we'll get that. So let's look at some examples. And this is going to be very hard to type and talk at the same time. So let's see if it works. First, let's go with uh, Neo4j, because it's fun, and I was talking about it last, so let's look at this. Now, remember when I was talking about the file permission system, which uh, we implemented in the little talk before? So this is a very small snapshot of that file to the permission system. Uh, can you all see this, or should I make it bigger? Bigger? Yeah. OK. So let's move this stuff around. OK, so this is a very uh, small uh, sample data set from that system. And as you can see, on the left, we have files, any kind of documents. Uh, we have groups. So we have users, and we have admins. We have roles. We have a couch-based role and a code motion role. And roles can, have, can belong to groups. Groups can belong to roles. And over here, we have users, which also belong either to groups or to roles. Or, and since it gets really crazy, they can also have direct permissions on the file. So for example, John here, as you can see, has a denied access permission on document two. So you shouldn't ever be able to see document two. Uh, now in this graph, right, how would we, for example, find 
uh, all the people who can access document 2. So in Neo4j, and I actually have the query prepared, the Neo4j queries are very simple. So we're looking for any user which has any kind of relationship of any length, so any number of jumps, to file name doc2, right? And if we look for that, what, we'll, what we find is that there, every user has some kind of relationship to file2. Of course, there are users that have allowed relationships with it, and there are users which have denied relationships to it, right? So I shouldn't be able to, uh, so John, in this case, shouldn't actually be in a data set if I want to find only the people who are allowed to access it. So let's say, let's find all the users who are actually allowed to see file two, which would be a slightly more complicated query. I want all the users, right, all the users view, which have an allow relationship, again, of any length, star means any length, uh, to another allow relationship, potentially, to file name doc2. And if we run this, we still get all four users, even though we know that John should never ever actually see file two because he has denied. But why does John see it? Because he belongs to a group which is allowed to use file two. Uh, again, this is a very weird use case, and here you have to see if you're, um, what's, uh, what has more priority, and the file system or the access control you're gonna use. So for, let's pretend that our fictional example that if you have a denied, it doesn't matter if, you, if you're allowed to see the file system, you should still never see it. Right, you, uh, so we need to add another query, which says give me all the people who are denied access to a file and subtract it from my result set, which means we need to complicate the query further. So now we have the same query as before, but now we can add a condition where not it has a relationship of deny to that file, right? So this will be the same query as before, minus all the people who actually have a denied relationship to the file. And if I run this, finally we'll get the result of only, let's move all the users here. All right, so now we only have the three people who are somehow connected with allows to the file, right? So in this case, and this query runs very fast, and obviously I only have a database with like five items in it, but we tested this on a production system with a million items, and, and the query was running in milliseconds rather than seconds, right? So the whole point is, if the data set is, uh, we'll talk about limits, but uh, on a fairly large data set, a graph database runs this query very quickly. The same query on MySQL would run for potentially 10 or 20 seconds actu on actual real data. So that was, uh, that was Neo4j. Let's uh, try a few things in OrientDB, which is, again, a very interesting database. Uh, now, important to know is I'm mostly talking about OrientDB uh, in the graph database context. It's not just a graph database. It's a multimodal database. It can store documents and objects and have relations between them. Uh, but for this talk, what's interesting to us is how do you run a graph query? Now, in this case, let's uh, look at all, uh, let's look at some of my prepared queries. Let's start with something very simple. This looks just like SQL, because it basically is, right? So let's find all the uh, items in the database with type artist, which would be all the artists from the band Grateful Dead. And if you run this, what we get is the names of all the artists, including Garcia Hunter and apparently Bo Diddley. And I swear I'm sure my father would know who these people are, but I'm sorry I don't. But Presumably, uh, some of those people wrote songs and some of them sang songs. So what if we want to find all the, um, uh, all the songs which were written and sung by the same person? So we, let's find all the uh, items which have a connection and a vertex called sung by connected to an, a vertex called written by from node with the name Garcia, which is one of the artists. So if we run this, we will in fact find that these are the people who wrote, uh, sorry, who sang the, the songs written by the artist known as Garcia. Um, my point isn't to talk about Grateful Dead, my point is to talk about different types of syntax you can use to query graphs. So this is very, uh, very convenient, and this is actually much more convenient than Cypher in, my, in many cases because it's based on SQL and it's much more familiar to most people. 
Uh, and it's very nice uh, to be able to use something familiar. Uh, but again, they serve different, uh, different use cases, right? This serves to query more of a standard find me something or other query type. Sorry. Whereas Cypher is much more useful for finding patterns in graph data, in connected data. Now, as I said, you can do both of those things, connect to both of those databases in Gremlin, and you can run Gremlin queries in both of those. So let's, uh, let's look at our uh, Neo4j database, and I'm actually going to load a different Neo4j database for this. So let's open. Uh, this is a database, uh, an example database that comes with Neo4j, which is just a snapshot of uh, something like uh, IMDb. It has a bunch of movies, actors, and uh, directors in it, and has connections of movies, actors, and directors. And you can search through it. It's not a real uh, production data set, but it's fun to explore and look at. Um, and of course, when you do live demos and you try to do stuff, uh, Neo4j ends up uh, dying. So let's kill it. And that's what happens when you do live coding. But okay, that's fine. This is what we have Gremlin for. We don't need Neo4j, we can use Gremlin. So in Gremlin, we can do the same query. Let's say we want to find, um, let's find Mel Brooks in this data set. How many people actually know who Mel Brooks is? One of the greatest movie directors of all times? Spaceballs, thank you very much. Someone, see, you, you notice only people above 30 raised their hands. So this is pretty much my demographic. Before 40, above 30, don't know who Grateful Dead are, do know who Mel Brooks is. Okay, so let's find in Gremlin, uh, I'm actually gonna scroll up a bit so you can see it, and we'll do a very simple Gremlin query. Let's take all the vertices, right? We're not uh, starting from a specific vertex, we're looking at all the vertices, which have the name Mel Brooks, and we'll just print, for now, print all the properties. Now this runs on Neo4j, right? I loaded a Neo4j database through Gremlin, and this query goes and actually just finds who has the name Mel Brooks. Now from Mel Brooks, we can start doing more interesting things. For example, let's find um, all the movies that he directed. So that would be the same query. And it's gonna be interesting how I type with just one hand. But let's say it has an, uh, an out edge. Yeah, this is not gonna work. We're gonna go to a more tried uh, method of cutting and pasting prepared queries because luckily I prepared. You'll, let's, let's pretend I typed this in real time, right? So now let's find all the um, movies which Mel Brooks actually directed. And it doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? Let's try it again. Okay, there we go. There, okay. So now it works, it just lost connection to the graph. Um, so now we have, again, all the uh, nodes which are named Mel Brooks, which have an out edge called directed, and then we just print the title or property of the uh, node it connects to, which is obviously all these movies. So now let's find all the um, movies uh, by genre, right? Because all of those properties, uh, all those movies have a property called genre, and we can do things like count all of them. So now we know that one of them is documentary, one's an action, one's a comedy. For, for whatever reason, Blazing Saddle is categorized as an action movie rather than a comedy, so we have that and so on and so forth, we can actually go and explore this database um, looking for all kinds of um, patterns. And we can do the same thing with, uh, uh, with OrionDB. So for example, if we open the Gremlin shell for OrionDB, 
we can go and uh, I happen to know that node 98 is an artist named Garcia. So if you go and take this node, we can go and find all the uh, songs written by Garcia in this way, right? We can find all the, um, all the songs which point to Garcia via a written by edge. So these are all the songs Garcia wrote. And if we want, we can go and, for example, and find all the only songs which have more than two performances, which would be something like this. Because in Gremlin, we can, sorry, we can take the same query and then we can run the filter on it and give it a filter condition. Because this is uh, actually a uh, functional language called, uh, called uh, Groovy. We can add um, a whole logical expression tree to it and ultimately it will run and return the uh, results here. So now hopefully Neo4j has recovered and we'll start this again. It has indeed recovered, right? Yes, perfect. Now we can go and query the same database we were querying through uh, Gremlin earlier. We can go and query it in Neo4j. So for example, we do in fact have um, all the movies that Mel Brooks both starred and directed in, right? So for example, let's look at this. No rows. Interesting. Oh, I know why. I need to refresh. Right. No, nope, this is what happens when you do live demos and they don't work. It now actually works, yeah? It does not. Okay. Well, uh, that's what you get for using uh, an older version of an open source database. Uh, this happens, but uh, we have three minutes left before lunch and people are getting restless and hungry. So I'm gonna skip the last demo. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I can, I'll be happy to answer them. If you don't, uh, we can go and all have lunch. Yes. See, they're, gonna, they're just gonna clap. <laughs> Now that we're done clapping, ask your question, sir. Thank you. So, so you said that there are hard limits on uh, the, the size of a graph of database, and what are those? Does it work? Ah, okay. Uh, just for that. <laughs> um, how um, how much is are the transition between uh, from uh, uh, relational databases uh, to graph databases? Right, so you have 
you know, your log system or whatever is going to keep records, you still keep on the initial system, but you just separate the uh, graph part and run through the graph database. Thank you. The answer is it's usually pretty hard to question. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's have a third question, just to have three, and then that's my third question. That's good then. Well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 Hello. Uh, in uh, which way the data are uh, stored in memory? Um, it depends on different databases. But usually, it's stored uh, as most uh, object database would as an object graph. It's, uh, yeah, there are lots of data, set, uh, data structures for graphs, and they actually work very well with some of the memory. So the memory part is actually pretty really easy. Starting them with disk in a way that's accessible as a graph is much harder. Now you can match. <laughs>